On my right here is James Jagasothi. James, would you like to give us a bit of an introduction to yourself? Sure. Um, my name is James. I'm the Director of Community Engagement and Strategy at the Office of Multicultural Interests here in Perth. I I've had a bit of a career all working with you know, culturally and linguistically diverse communities for about 20 years now. I think um, I started off getting, you know, volunteering at Amnesty on the phones and helping school children get presents for children in detention. I went on and studied law and politics and um, I ended up working in refugee advocacy for a number of years in Sydney. And at some point in 2012, I moved here and I managed a program for the Australian Red Cross, working with, again, with asylum seekers, but people who had just been released from detention, whether here or uh, overseas, and working with them through their initial settlement. And now I work, I guess I work for the government now. Outside of this, I'm, I've also been on the Ethnic Communities Council of Western Australia. I'm the current vice chair of the uh, the Centre for Asylum Seekers, Refugees and Detainees here in Perth, and I've run Welcome to Australia here. Lots of random things, but all pretty much with a, with a very similar sort of mindset. And I mean, there's an obvious sort of rhyme and reason to it. I guess uh, for me, it does make sense, and it doesn't have to be the only way I do things, but I came here as a refugee in the 80s from Sri Lanka at the time of, I guess, um, the height of its civil war, which has now actually been over for about 10 years as of this month. We, um, we, well, my father was sort of a human rights activist and he was a chair of a human rights organization in the east of Sri Lanka. And his actions were really to be the negotiator for Tamil communities in that area with the armed forces, with the military and navy, and also with the, um, the rebels, the LTTE, the Tamil Tigers, as people might know them. And of course, he moved internal displaced people around, did a lot of negotiations between communities. And eventually, of course, that got him blacklisted by everyone. So it, wasn't, it didn't end up being a very safe place for us, and we were internally displaced for a while. I won't go into details, but it's like, you know, that kind of story where you have, you know, dead bodies nailed to your front door and my we had a shooting in our house, my brother nearly died, and all these kinds of things of, you know, trying to go to hospitals using a cloth diaper as a white flag, all this kind of very kind of, you know, interesting and exciting story. I won't go into it, but and my dad tells it much better anyway. I was, <laughs> but in all honest truth, but I was a child then, so it's not that I completely understood it in that complete context. For me, if you look at photos of me as a child, I'd asked for army trucks as birthday cakes, because, of course, as a child, some of it was traumatic, but other parts of it were kind of exciting in, in the context in which I understood it anyway. Um, and eventually, Australia kindly brought us here on a special humanitarian program, and we were treated much better than the way in which people are treated now. In fact, Royal Dutch Airlines, which is KLM, actually flew us over business class, <laughs> which is... Um, a very different form of treatment to the way that refugees and asylum seekers are treated today. But it was, um, it was obviously wonderful for us, and I feel very, very fortunate in my current place. I mean, I often think the sort of the, the happy irony of the fact that um, I fled a government that was, that had sort of pushed sort of what would otherwise be sort of apartheid style, you know, separatist type of politics, and I have the fortune to be working for a government agency that looks at inclusion. So I consider myself incredibly fortunate and I feel like my work life I've had some great opportunities to do that as well. Yeah. Thank great. You. That's a wonderful introduction. Thank you for Thank sharing you. that story. There's lots of fascinating <laughs> detail yes. that we'd love to know more about. But um, Marilyn, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I guess I came to Perth as an 18 year old student, um, migrant, um, and I've been living in Perth since. Um, I guess that's, I guess the migrant story is part of my experience. Um, professionally I've worked as a family counsellor um, in family violence and in the trauma space for the last two decades. Um, 
I also run an NGO metamorphosis that's providing access to education for stateless children. Um, I guess my passion is really using um, storytelling as a tool to, to help us navigate a very, very complex and diverse, um, I guess all, all our very different um, diverse journeys and my particular passion is in human rights and social justice and how we can use stories and how important it is for us to provide access to that uh, and education is one pathway but I think um, it's really about the fact that we're sitting up here um, as, as complicated as that is um, it's important that I continue to use the forum that I have and the privilege that I have to um, continue to tell the stories that don't often get told. That's my little mm. five Thank you. And um, James reminded us before we got up today that the focus of the festival this year is on truth and story and um, how those sometimes do go together and sometimes don't. And I think. Um, it's really important to have those stories, just to being able to tell your story as a first start, especially in, um, in areas of trauma, is a really important just to have a voice somewhere. Um, so the topic of today's uh, session is Australia is a diverse country with a rich migrant history. Despite this, new arrivals who make their way here are still lumped into one category, refugees. This fascinating panel um, uncovers the inspirational truth about these migrants and where they come from. I um, have looked at this question very carefully over the last couple of weeks, and there are a few inherent problems in this, and the, I felt inherent in the panel that was put together. We're missing one guest, Esther Onik, who was uh, due to join us. Uh, she is also a refugee of African descent. Um, but it really struck me in looking at this question of if we break this down into, first of all, migration as an Australian story, and then the issue of the refugee story within that, I didn't want to get backed into a corner here because we're all a panel of people of colour. And the association between being refugees and being people of colour really is missing the rest of this big diverse story, which is that migration is a story that belongs to everybody except, of course, for the First Nations people. Mm. So I felt that the premise of this was slightly problematic and that ran the whole thing together into a current day, slightly inflammatory proposition. And I'd like to step back away from that because I think it's really dangerous when that immediately goes to a racialized discussion. And I wondered of all you wonderful, diverse people out there, particularly those who are not people of color, how many of you are first generation migrants? Look, there are lots of stories out there. Is anyone, would any, if any of you would like to come and fill the space and make our panel more diverse, and this is a genuinely uh, positively discrimination offer, um, <laughs> if any of you would like to join here, I think it is important just to acknowledge that the story is, is a big one, especially because the history of migration to Australia was largely dominated by European and British people for a long time, and the tipping point into now having a greater majority of migrants from Asia and Southeast Asia is only now just happening. And there are layers and layers of stories and truths, all of which should be honored in this conversation hmm. because the history of migration to Australia from Europe and Britain wasn't necessarily a happy one for some of the people who made their way hmm. here as well and more recent people from the Balkans, etc. So we don't want to rest the story and all the assumptions that we're going to talk about today with people of colour. We need to keep it a really um, broad uh, thing. So I'll leave that invitation open and if anyone feels the need to jump up, yes, wonderful. you're welcome to join us. And I think it's good to have everybody's perspective. We have So that goes to the kind of the first question here. As I said, our stats are changing at the moment. And um, historically, there was a policy that really determined where people came from, based on being Thank you. mainly European. Welcome. Welcome. Well, <laughs> oh, hello, I'm James. I'm just going to give you the mic, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> but also thank you. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us your story of being a migrant? 
Yes, um, briefly. Um, my name's Mary, and I was born in Glasgow, in Scotland. Um, my mother... Uh, can you hear? <laughs> right, okay. My, I was born in Glasgow, in Scotland, at the end of the Second World War, because my mother was evacuated from the south of England, where there was a lot of German bombers coming over our house. So I was born in, in Glasgow, and we moved here. With, I moved here with my husband a few years ago, and I became a migration agent here. I mean, there's quite a lot of it. I'm, ga I'm, ga I'm glossing over, but um, anyway, <laughs> I'm pleased to be here today, and will answer and join in this as best I can. Great. Wonderful. Thank Thanks, you. Mary. Thank you for joining us. So I thought we'd just start by unpicking this issue of race in migration today. Um, especially because we are in a, in a time where that is shifting and the country of origin of a lot of our recent migrants, particularly economic migrants, is now moving towards Asia. And I'm wondering if any of you would like to comment on how you feel that is affecting the view of migration currently. Great question. I think um, the other work that I do is teach anthropology and sociology at Curtin University. And I think one of the things that we, we do have to tackle is how a lot of the conversations that we have, particularly with young people, around identity and race and gender, I think often gets lost in um, the, the kind of um, us, our, our capacity to put the person at the center of the story. Because I think that that often is lost, and, and the, the whole question around migration, that the diversity of that is important. But I think at the end of the day, it's really who gets, whose story gets amplified, who gets, whose story get to be in the books, in mm. the media, uh, get to be in forums like this. I think the power element is really important. And the other thing that I would say about race is that it is, inescapably a visible thing. I cannot escape how I look. Um, I often, and I've been teaching for 20 years, it's not uncommon that I would walk up the front of the classroom, next to lecterns, and face a room with quite a lot of surprised people. Because, simply because they haven't seen an Asian and a woman standing up in front of class. And that's not part of their everyday experience. And I think the visibility of that is something that we are probably not as skilled talking about. Uh, it is, uh, if, you're any, if you sound different, if you speak with an accent, if you look different, if you dress different, that is the first thing that people see. And I think that is, a, the, is the marker of difference, that we as a society are not as skilled talking about. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I tend to agree, but and I think, look, in all truth, like, if we talk about migration, or especially in terms of migration, immigration policy, it is discriminatory by nature. You know, immigration is discriminatory. That's the idea of it, you know. We have nation states, and we choose who comes and how they come. That's what the policy is all about. So there's inherently an element of discrimination in that. That's just, it's actually just what it is. And I guess in that sense, we're already in that mindset. We are predisposed to thinking about immigration from the point of view of discriminating between certain classes of people in any case. So I think there's always that, and I think it's also sort of part of our nature and to always, you know, we look at, we always talk about othering and things of that nature. But it's also, the idea of immigration, it's someone from another nation coming to your nation, there's always an us and them. And it's always easier for some people to become an us. Obviously, at some point in Australian history, Greeks and Italians and people from, you know, Southern Europe, it wasn't easy for them to be an, an us. And over time, that has changed. Our norms, our values have altered. And now, if you're an African, or if you're from Middle East, or if you're from Asia, you're more obviously not us. So clearly, that rises when we talk about immigration in a general sense, even with the numbers being as they are. So I feel there is a sort of a natural understanding of that is the disposition of us when we talk about immigration to understand it as an us and them, a discriminatory mm. argument. And of course, for so long, we were dominated by uh, migrants from the UK who brought a, you know, a very strong us and in a colonial sense. Um, but do we think that the 
sense of national identity is being challenged by the new, the new pattern of migration? Well, we came here. Can you use I your was... microphone. Up? Sorry, uh, we came here. I am English, but my husband's from the States, hmm. so we were already um, multinational. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, mm. and fit it in, we, we weren't bothered too much because we were used to sort of having to translate between each other anyway. <laughs> mm. 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 I think that question of national identity is becoming so critical when we seem to be more across the world now obsessed with sovereignty and sovereign borders and trying to determine what happens within them. Um, and the other thing, of course, is this perceived idea that um, the newer migrants aren't fully committed, that they've got a foot in both camps, so to speak. But a lot of, um, a lot of migrants, whatever the background, are also carrying these very big invisible stories, which is why I'm interested in your work in particular, because those stories and a lot of the, that happened outside the country are now being carried in this country as well. And the, the ability of people to kind of, I guess, rest those stories somewhere without... Uh, without requiring them to make a break from the countries and the traditions and the families that they've left behind, to still be able to have a porous sense of our identity that allows people to travel between cultures. Do you find that a common discussion? Yes. Yeah? Um, I, guess, I guess so. I think. Round or no, 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 no. We've, we've got these. We've got a. It's oh, okay. I okay. see. Thank you. No, I, I guess so. I mean, identity is. is, is a, I think I find it very interesting with identity. I think at the moment, especially with younger people, the idea of understanding where you fit in within your culture, is um, it's one that's really up there in terms of, I guess, importance to the individual. But I don't know if I've missed that generation. But I do think when I was young, and for me living in Australia, there was a pragmatic element of becoming more Australian. My parents, we lived in a country town in New South Wales, a place called Parks. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, you might have seen it in the news more recently because of course the radio telescope was there and you know, the moon landing. <laughs> so, but at the time we lived there, it was a very much a country town. There was, you know, there was a Greek family, they had the fish and chip shop. There was a Chinese family, they had the Chinese restaurant. They had opened a roundabout during our time. It was, <laughs> it, it was a very typical Australian country town for the time. And for us, there was a real pragmatic impetus to be as Australian as possible. My parents had, had so really... you're saying there that, in a way, the Chinese, oh, family, the, the Chinese family remained Chinese in the Australian's eyes and also in your own. In a sense, and I believe I remain Sri Lankan. Oh, sorry, I believe I probably remain Sri Lankan in their eyes as well, or they probably would know a Sri Lankan Indian or whatever they might have thought. Mm. In their, yeah, I think there is an element of that. I just think for me, I think at the time, I, I just think it's interesting because now I feel like we have more openness to think about identities in a different way. I feel the nature of migration, the number of migrants, and how much more inclusive our society actually is, allows us to talk about identity and to be engaging in those topics more readily. So I do feel when I was young, like for example, my parents allowed me to lose my first language, which in a modern, you know, uh, contemporary sort of, I don't know, inner city liberal sort of way of looking at it, you'd be like, oh no, you must maintain cultures and you know, people have to learn other languages, all this kind of thing. And that always has its value. But in the world in which I lived at the time, my parents thought the most important thing, considering sort of the circumstances in which we came here, was that this person gets to fit in. That our children live a life with the least amount of, you know, worry, at least from those things that they can't control. So, in fact, they actually sent me to elocution classes for me to lose my accent, you know? And now that would almost seem politically incorrect, you know? But these are pragmatic decisions made at a different time. Do you think your parents were right? I think they did everything for the best intentions. I feel some shame in having lost my native tongue or my mother tongue. Of course. I mean, especially when I go back to Sri Lanka. Ah. Yes, absolutely. There's, there's a different ah. shame there. Yeah. That's different, isn't it? Mm. Yes. Because then when you go back, then you're part of that culture once again. Looking, and it's probably. You don't quite sound... Uh, microphone. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you might look Sri Lankan, but when you open your mouth, you probably sound Australian. Mm. A little bit? 
Yeah. I think that was the intention. Mm. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, well, you know, I have a, I have a, a migratory background. I grew up in four countries, and I have about four different ethnicities to claim, and I don't really feel I belong in any of them. Um, everywhere I go, everyone asks me, where are you from? Yeah. Um, in all of those countries. So I know that feeling of kind of, um, yeah, you, you kind of are always then circling around on the outside. But you're a different story because you came as an adult um, and as a student. So um, your experience has been later in life as an adult. What, what would you um, say? It has. I was actually born in Malaysia and I was sent to Singapore to be educated when I was nine, so I had experienced that from nine years old, and then came to Australia when I was 18. And I think what James oh. was saying, what you were saying, is that I think one of the things that a lot of the, um, a lot of migrants and, and you know, um, ref people from refugee backgrounds share is that it is often a story of survival. Um, it takes a lot of work to adjust and, and to adapt to a new country and I think often having to constantly having to figure out who you are and then having to find a way to explain that to other people and that never I've been here 28 years that will give you a sign of how old I am <laughs> <laughs> and that never that doesn't stop and I think one thing that I really uh, have a much more appreciation of now is that you don't lose that sense of hope. And I think this beautiful thing that um, Uncle Barry Maguire said last night at the launch about how he explained that you know, his parents uh, wrote seven books. There were just seven children. Mm -hmm. And I never really thought of that, that I had been born a book mm -hmm. um, and that my parents had written five books. And I sort of thought about it last night, reflected on that last night, that each of us also carry our parents' books. Um, and I think I, I did my PhD on my mother's story, on trying to capture, my mother had been given, given away as a baby, um, never went to school, one of the, the brightest minds I've mm. never known. But she, she supported me and I'm here today because of her capacity to dream beyond the limits of her life. And I think, I've carried her book and my, my dad's book and my grandparents' mm. book in me. I love that idea. I love that I don't often have the capacity to explain where I come from, um, where I belong. And I think that's, um, it's a much more interesting thing to think about my life as books, mm. multiple books. Mm. Um, I recently had an extraordinary experience um, I was seconded to the Kimberleys for six weeks as part of the Jawan uh, program and I had the most extraordinary experience and one of the things that I came away from is in the 28 years, in fact the all of my life, spending time on country with our beautiful First Nation people was the first time in my entire life that I felt I belonged, mm. that I felt welcomed and I have a completely different understanding of what welcome to country really means on a bodily and cellular level. Hmm. And it's, I think it made me sort of came away thinking what we need to be giving our new, um, you know, people who've come to seek asylum, refuge, seek a new home, new migrants, um, people who've come to, to, to work in industries where we don't have enough people. I think we need to be able to create a space to welcome them in the way that we haven't done very well in our history. Um, yeah. It's a very powerful thing and I was thinking about that this morning and coming here that one of the things I miss the most is the connection to a land and to a landscape to just be able to look um, at a place and, and feel I know it very well. Um, I've been able to attach myself to a few but um, you also, your, your story of your mother reminded me of something that's happened to me twice, and you might have a comment on this, in the last year, twice, um, once in New Zealand, I noticed a lady walking past, an elderly lady walking past my house in a howling, terrible winter storm, not adequately dressed, and when I went out to see if she was okay, 
She told me she was fine. She was just on her way to Samoa. Um, she, was, she was going home uh, oh, and she was going to walk there through this howling storm. So I said, would you like to stop for a cup of tea on the way? And she came in and I tracked down her family. Um, and she had mild dementia. But just last week on the bus in Perth, I also encountered an older lady who was very, very upset. And when I asked her if she was okay, I think, I suspect she also had dementia. She said, no, I'm not okay. I'm trying to get to Aberdeen. I have to go home. I have to go home. And the bunny bus driver keeps driving me around Perth. Um, <laughs> and I just thought, I, I, both of those made me go, well, well, I'm older. And when my mind gets to that place, where is it going to think it needs to go home uh, to? Aberdeen is, she's in Scotland. Scotland. Yeah, she's trying she to get to Scotland. Australian no, no, she's trying to get to Scotland. Aberdeen. No. Oh, Scotland. No. Wow. And it just made me think how powerful that is, that at that stage in life when your mind goes into kind of that stage that what draws you to home, what becomes mm. the most kind of strong images that you revert to? I thought it was a really interesting question. But you touched on something else, of course, which is that um, a lot of migrants here are coming here because they have skills that we need now. Mm. Um, and how we welcome them and make them feel a sense of permanency in, in Australia is, is really important. But I think we'll then get on to the difficult topic now of refugees rather than migration in general, which is where I wanted to start, um, because that's the very topical and long-running issue in Australia at the moment and the debate around detention centres and what we need to think about in that space. And I think, James, hearing a story like yours, a positive story, is a reminder that, in fact, there are programs that resettle people within Australia in a very positive way and in the last year or so they increased the quota that they were taking through the UNHCR program by 30% which is quite significant from say 13,000 or so up to 18,000 so we're currently going at quite a high rate but on the other hand we've got this kind of catastrophizing going on with um, people in detention centre and a perceived threat to our boundaries and they don't seem to make sense when you put them together um, and the question really is how much of that is just a political game playing mm. against the reality of what is happening on the ground for refugees in Australia? Mm. Um, it's, it's a great question. It's something that I have been, I guess, grappling with for a very long time, both in my sort of professional life but also personally um, because I, I work with a lot of um, stateless and, and um, refugee children who are sort of trapped in urban refugee camps in cities like Kuala Lumpur and Jakarta, um, and also um, newly resettled migrant family, um, refugee, families from refugee backgrounds in Perth. It goes back, I think, to the history that we have as a nation, and I think we need to acknowledge that history that this nation has with our first people and it's still grappling, it's still struggling and in many ways still in denial. And I think we have this very, very problematic relationship with who is this us and them and how we, we have this really quite one of the world's most successful resettlement programs in the world. And I think one of the things that, um, and those of you who have seen um, the Adam Goods documentary, one of the comments that Walid Ali said in that documentary, which sort of captured and helped me understand, is to say that we are very welcoming, historically, of migrants and refugees. And we've got this great, you know, um, sort of, the, we look at the Vietnamese uh, resettlement program. We had one of the most successful programs. As long as you don't cause any trouble, as long as you don't be too outspoken, if you're not too vocal, if you don't stir this melting pot of ours. And I think that that's something that we need to acknowledge. Um, the way we are dealing with people who come to seek asylum by boat. You mean that they, when they come, they've got to join in? The, the they've got to settle in, they've got to settle in to us. They've got to join in here. Never mind about where you've come from, but we will accept them happily if they join in with us here and start going to sending the kids to proper school and doing the, the, doing the things that we'd like Australians to do. 
But they're well, still harping on the problems from overseas. They're going to have more trouble settling here, aren't they? I think. Uh, I, think take a lead. Well, <laughs> I think. Uh, well, mm. I mean, so, can I can I just continue? Sorry, I'm interrupting um, you. Yeah, so that is that is part of a, a dominant narrative, right? That somehow that if you come from overseas or from a different culture, that you are going to first of all struggle to assimilate. I, I don't really understand what assimilating into Australian nurse actually look like. If somebody could tell me, that would be great. But I I suspect that that is a problematic idea. Um, to start off with. Sorry, I've just lost my train of thought there. Um, yeah, so I think part of, part of the, the challenge of us having conversations like this is, from my experience and from a lot of experience of people that I work with, is that the minute I came to this country, I have not stopped working really hard just to be. And that includes explaining who I am and um, justifying my presence in, in this, this country. And I think part of that is because we do have a system that made it really, really difficult. Um, we, we, we create this sort of system of, of, of othering and we have so many different ways we other people, including how we look, how we, you know, whether you speak with an accent, um, the, the perceived difference that we have, that we project onto people, is an ongoing problem. All, a lot of us come from backgrounds that are complex. Uh, there's a lot of people from refugee background that comes with a whole uh, a lot of history of, of trauma. And I think, in spite of that, they work really, really hard every single day just to fit in, and whatever that means. So. I'm not going to attempt to try and, that, that's just, mm. I want to just put it out there. Mm. Can, can, I, can I just say, you know, I, from what Marilyn's saying, and I guess, you know, to answer your question, Mary, or, or, or either it's a comment that a lot of people make, absolutely. And you're, you're right, people come here with lots of baggage. I mean, we all come here with baggage. We like, all do. But I, mean, I guess... We want to be here, we don't want to be where we came from, absolutely. usually. And I guess one of the things with that is, we don't talk about assimilation as much as integration, and part of that is it's a bit of a sharing of things. And people who come here, you're right, with lots of baggage and with lots of other worries on their mind, they also come here with resilience. They come here with the positive attributes of character, they come here with a bit of risk-taking, and those are things that they add to our society. So in a way, we do kind of want them to keep thinking about their home country. In a way, the fact that they think about the world as a globalised place where we are connected to each other, connected to our various homelands, these are things that add to our Australian dynamic and add mm. to our character as Australia. And I guess when we think it's about... It's an adventure coming here, isn't it? For Absolutely. people coming. They don't know what they're coming to. Absolutely. Right? Unless they've been here for a Absolutely. holiday first. Absolutely. Um, oh. And it's a great adventure to come. It's a bit scary. It's a bit scary, absolutely. Well, I guess it's the how as well, because for some people, it's an incredibly traumatic journey mm -hmm. to get here. And that's the other question, I guess, that we, we really need to consider is, um, as an island nation being so far away, we've been very privileged in many ways to be able to control the ins and outs. And the thing that's the most threatening, I think, that the Australian psyche um, is not quite... A, understood how to deal with is asylum as the, the first point of asylum, which many other countries do. I grew up in Zimbabwe and, you know, in Africa, poor old Mozambique has probably millions of displaced people, and it's a country with no resources, dealing with people walking across its borders in great need. Um, and I think it's that area of compassion around that first point of asylum that is perhaps for me one of the most concerning, because the resettlement programs through UNHCR are, of course, very highly controlled, vetted, and managed within um, a process that um, has been mandated internationally. But it's that real point of asylum, and I think more and more people uh, are seeking that. Yeah. Look, the asylum system is not good in any case. I mean, we know there's about 65 or 67 million people in the world who are displaced, who are not living in the homes where they are. Well, their countries. About 25 million of those people are refugees, so they're outside of their home country, they're seeking protection, their current, their country of nationality can't afford them that protection. 
and the system, the UNHCR, countries like Australia, people who are signatories, the Geneva Convention, we only take about 0.5% of those people every year. So it's a very weak system. In Australia itself, we do spend lots of money. You're right, there are great programs in Australia. And we spend about a little over $200 million on settlement programs. And it seems like a large amount of money, and it is a large amount of money. But I guess to answer the original question about the politics of it, we would spend about three to four billion dollars every year on our offshore detention and border uh, control. Uh -huh. So that's how much we spend to keep out so many people. But for all those people we're doing our best to support in this country, we spend about 200 million. And it uh. kind of gives you a bit of an intention, or an understanding of what the intention is of the government. Is it about, you know, the finances? Is it about doing the right thing practically for Australia or for our economy? It's hard to, it's hard to, it's, it's, it's a bit easy to come up with what the answer is to that. I think, um, yeah, so, so I'm not sure. So there is a level of humanity to it because we have laws that have been around for 70 odd years that give specific protection to refugees. And we also have laws that are there for specific protection to, I guess, um, migrant workers. But the way in which the system works is fairly, uh, you, you'd say it's not really fit for purpose. Mm. And do you think that this kind of, sense of crisis, possibly unjustified, um, is making us as a society less compassionate? See, I don't think we are less compassionate. We're not less compassionate. It's, it's a bit, obviously, like, you know, some of us have, you know, certain biases, some of us maybe racist, some of us might have different versions of what we think the best economic rationale is for Australia, or whether we have a big Australia or a little Australia, all that kind of stuff. We might have ideas about different countries, but we are not any less compassionate. And I think the thing that makes that really obvious to me is the fact that, you know, the government has, we have policies where we want to keep what's ha happening on Nauru or Manus hidden. We want to make sure that we punish whistleblowers a certain way. We want to make sure the medical opinions are not shown. All those things tell me that the underlying belief of the government is Australians are compassionate. If they knew this, they would want something different. You know? Mm. So, mm. I feel like good point. Yeah, a good point. I, I think, in, in all truth, when it comes to refugees, it's, you know, for me, it's fairly obvious in the sense that there's so many people who, when called to action, they volunteer their time, they visit people in detention, they make donations, they do all sorts of good things. Look, I'm the vice chair, oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to that. But I'm the vice chair of the Centre for Asylum Seekers, Refugees, and Detainees, and, um, Every time there's a bad policy announced, we get more donations, you know? It reflects who Australians are. Mm. The policies reflect something else. And I think that's something that I always consider. And, I, and, I, and even like, you know, you were talking about your experience of like I often think even in terms of, um, you know, when we found out about what was happening in Dondale to young indigenous children in Northern Territory, when you found out, well, even, I mean, not this is the same thing, but even when we found out what was happening to the live sheep trade, when Australians saw those things, we saw compassion in action. And we saw change very quickly as well. I think, to me, it just shows Australians are compassionate. And for certain government policies, that's the problem. You have to have a publicity, though, before you can start realising where compassion has to be shown. Absolutely. You Absolutely. You have to get into the problem before you even begin. If you, don't, if, you, if you don't hear about it, if it's all hidden away by politics or the people are just not exposed to the newspapers, I don't know. But it's, it's a good enough, point. It's easy enough to mm. hide problems. It is, not to know. And um, at the Premier's Book Awards last night, the Emerging Writers Award was won by Renee Petit Ship for her book, um, The Sky Runs Through Us. Is that the title? And she wrote that after her experience teaching on... Christmas Island, um, on Christmas Island, uh -huh. and um, it's a beautiful, heartfelt book of poetry, and she was very emotional when she won it, but what struck me also is that she'd been too scared to write that book for some time because she was afraid of the consequences of, I guess she was breaking some laws or confidentiality agreements maybe, by writing what she'd seen in those centres. Um, and so you're so right about information and this is where we get back to truth and story, isn't it? Yeah. Being able to hear those stories and understand them at that um, direct level. Mm -hmm. 
So what are those what are the avenues? I mean, in your experience, where if you are interested in engaging with this, where would you look? Um, can I sort of go back to that compassion thing? Because mm. I think you're absolutely right. I agree that there is no shortage of compassion around the world. It's not just in Australia. I think Australian are particularly compassionate people. But what we're grappling with is this sort of idea that a lot of our compassion is used, the energy that we would otherwise use for compassionate things are used up with an increasing anxiety and fear that is being con constantly fed into the dominant narrative about anyone who's different. And at the moment, it's people who are from Muslim background who look like a Muslim, people who arrived to, on our shore by boats. Um, and I think people who might have some sort of nasty disease that they, mm. you haven't quite figured out what it is. And, and part of that, I think, is part of this dominant narrative is the myth. There's a lot of myths about who these people are, including the fact that they might carry disease. They will not assimilate properly. They are going to cause trouble. They are criminals or they are tr so traumatized. There is no chance of them assimilating into the Australian society. And, and those myths home. are exactly why we need truth telling. As much as truth telling is one of the beautiful things that has come out of the Uluru Statement with our First Nation people is that we have to challenge those myths that are circulating unquestioned. What I get the most hope is working with young people. They mm -hmm. are quite extraordinary in their capacity to work through uh, and to be really, really um, compassionate. And I think to bring young people into this conversation, we, we do a lot of work, our organization do a lot of work with schools. And I think that's, that's truth has, we, we have to engage young people in truth telling. Um, and I think that's, that's a big part, misting, uh, sort of busting the myth that's circulating around refugees, um, migrants. I think that's, that's a, big, a big task that we, I think we, the, the, the panel before about charging our young people uh, as parents, as teachers, as aunties and uncles, grandparents. We need to be, to be brave and um, to be having really difficult conversation, challenging conversation with young people because they are more than ready for those conversations. You mean um, we should be, uh, I should be addressing my son, for example, and saying, look, um, what are you actually doing about helping the, uh, migrants? Um, or, you know, uh, I just can't begin, begin to think about this. How would we, how would we approach this? Well, I guess that... What would, where would we start to say, to motivate our younger people in the, in the, in the population to notice that there are people coming into our country who are having trouble fitting in? Well, I, I, I think that people notice. I don't, I don't think it's a question of um, noticing, but I think it's a question of learning to listen, learning to listen empathetically, um, and also, I guess, a greater awareness of the kind of a, a cultural diversity that, um, that doesn't need to challenge everybody, that there is room for many different kinds of ways of, of being. Um, that we, you know, there isn't, there isn't a, there isn't the problem. I think what um, you're saying, Marilyn, is that the minute we start talking about it as if it's a problem, that is the problem, because in fact, there isn't a problem really to a huge extent. But James, from your point of view, I think there's an interesting question about, is there more that can be done to support that next generation that is growing up, as you did, within mm. Australia? Because you've achieved a huge amount. I mean, you're sure. extremely high achieving. Um, do you think there's anything that we can, as a society, do more to support? Yeah, of course. I mean, I guess for me, you know, coming from a government point of view as well, I guess, I think about these things more in terms of, not as much about you know, young people in general, but I guess 
we just want to increase people's participation in everything. I mean, everyone who's come here today has come as a matter of, you know, civil participation, haven't you? You know, you want to learn about new ideas, you want to think about things more, and perhaps that'll influence the way you, you vote, who you write letters to, where you don't go, what films you see, I don't know. But the, I think, for me, it's more about finding ways in our systems that encourage people who come from migrant and refugee backgrounds to participate in society. And sometimes it's about things that are really governmental, like how do we ensure that you know, certain people's overseas qualifications are recognised here. Uh -huh. mm. How do we, you know, how do we look to ensure that, you know, how, uh, how housing operates, or how do we, uh, there's a whole bunch of different things in terms of urban planning and in terms of, um, mm. I guess, education and other policies. And I feel it's more about that participation element, you know. How do we ensure that people from different backgrounds run for your council elections? Yeah. Yeah. How do we, when we look at voting, how do we look at people there? Do we just look at people based on who we already know? Do we read what they're about? Do we think about it in terms of, I guess, you know, individual policies, what people stand for? It's more about participation for me than, than necessarily focusing just on young people to that degree. And to be honest, older Australians tend to do a lot more for asylum seekers and refugees. Young people do protest, and that's fantastic, that's real civic participation, it's out there trying to change policies. But to be honest, if I look at the volunteers who turn up to many of the refugee programs, especially the ones that have been there long going, they're actually older Australians. Mm. They're actually people who, you know, and some of it might be because they have time, but other parts of it is also because they have life experience and they feel like they can give it. And they've also thought about things perhaps more deeply as well. And I find that very encouraging. They probably uh, um, had some ups and downs in their own lives. Absolutely. And yeah. they can have more better empathy. Yeah. Um, and they can, can see, well, you know, this, this kid's coming to school in, in clothes that are essentially ragged. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, how to make a polite and, and gentle inquiry as to whether the family has actually got sustenance yeah. would be a start. But it's yeah. not easy, no. actually. Yeah. And you have to be really quite careful and... and, and and, and accept, from where the, the, accept them as they are, and then say, think, well, you can go, go from here a little bit, uh, like, gently to there, mm. I mm. think. Absolutely. I, I think this question of participation is a really, a really key one, um, to do with visibility and profile, uh, and I guess also allowing um, people to take, you know, broader responsibility across the community than otherwise have been. But I'd also like to make a little plug for the Arts Voice here because um, at the Helpman Awards uh, last month, the, the standout friend, winner yes. was Counting and Cracking yeah. from Sri Lanka. Yes, he's a friend um, of mine. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's stunning and it's going to go um, internationally, this piece. I was there at the inception of the, you know, when, the, when it was just a play and there was a discussion about how to produce it many years ago. And it was really interesting in the room, there were two questions was, is this really an Australian story? And the second one is, but we, couldn't, we wouldn't be able to find a cast for this. Mm. Because um, people didn't, A, assume that a story that was based largely in Sri Lanka with the end of the story being the migration to Australia was enough of an Australian story, first of all. And the second thing is they assumed that there wasn't a level of professionalism in the community that would be able to cast this quite large piece. Um, and so years later, it was a vindication to see it take out all the major theatre awards this year, um, and hopefully um, it will come to Perth at some point. But those are really important turning points um, when places like these cultural institutions start to tell those stories and reflect mm. the diversity of our communities so, and I, and better. I, and I love the arts as well, but and honestly, like we want to see, I want to see it in other parts as well. To be honest, you have a team like England, you know, the home of cricket, who've had Nasser Hussain as their captain, you know? An Indian-born boy who grew up in the UK. It's, and we've had, you know, Sikhs playing for, we, have, we currently have one, I guess, person, play, you know, Kawaja playing for Australia, but you see it in terms of our sporting culture. I, watched, I watch our Australian netball team because they're winners, so it's great to watch them. Oh, until, until last they, week, just like to until say. Last, until last week, yeah. But, but they destroyed Sri Lanka Go by about like four, four times. But, but the thing is, they are, but when you look at the team, like you don't see any diversity. And I guess, and I think for me, like I think netball sort of like is one thing where I feel like there's so many people play netball, like all young girls essentially play, you know, there's such a high percentage of people playing it. But yet when you look at the elite levels, we don't see people representing in the, 
You don't see it. Top I, shows. I haven't ever watched netball on telly. <laughs> yes. So, um, do you mean to say that they're all standard white Australian girls? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm saying they don't represent the fact that 30% of us were born overseas and 17% of those people would be from non-English speaking backgrounds. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm. But they're not getting into the netball team. Mm. <laughs> it's not everything, but it's a, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. But but essentially, this. yes. Yeah. No, no, there's many key areas, <laughs> as not? you say, um, <laughs> and you know, some of the key areas are in academia, in science, and technology is another key one, <laughs> especially as we're moving towards a society where so much more is going to be built on control of technology, artificial intelligence, profiling, all those other ethical questions that are going to face us as a human society, yeah. if we don't have the most diverse representation sure. in those discussions, it gets to be pretty scary. Um, so those are the areas, as you say, yeah. that it's... I think it's fantastic that you're, of course, you know, the CEO of the Chamber of Arts and Culture, but of course, if you look at those very liberal entities that we have in, well, in the arts or education, there's very, even non-for-profits, mm. even though you might think they might be perhaps more liberal thinking, more left-leaning, they tend to have less diversity in leadership. Mm. There's not one non-European background um, vice-chancellor of a university in Australia. Yeah. You know? mm. This is, we, we, I think we forget that these people actually, yeah. they don't get to where they are. Like I, you know, I've spoken to different you know, government departments about this and they talk about diversity and they do a good job. But if you ask real key questions about what they do and where they get the diversity statistics from, they're actually referring to the bus drivers and the cleaners in the departments, not people in their executive office. It's, yeah. um, it's mm. very indicative of class side in yeah. Sense, yeah, and you know, in some ways, it is a natural human instinct that you have to overcome that you veer towards people like us, mm. and we all do it to some extent. But when you're in a, a public forum or a you know democracy or a workspace, um, there's so many studies that have now proven that you will function better, you'll get better results if mm. you have a better representation of the diversity of your population in those spaces, whether you're trying to sell things or make mm. things, whatever. Um, you're holding yourself back if you don't actually include more people in the conversation. Yeah, but it's interesting, isn't it? Because I was just thinking, I live in a, a very English village in the hills in Darlington. And we are all pretty much like me. And it's quite attractive. Um, so I can understand mm. somebody coming in that they want to settle in a place where others are like from wherever they came from. Yeah, mm. totally. And mm. um, they'd be happy to go to work with other people who came from where they came from too. Mm. Yeah. But what we're looking for is diversity. Mm. Well, what Absolutely. we're looking for, no, we're not really looking for, it's not about diversity actually, it's more Isn't about, it? inc I feel it's, it's more about inclusion. Because you know what, there's absolutely nothing wrong with wanting to live amongst people who look like you. <laughs> it makes sense. It, it makes sense to be with people who have share things with you. You look at Australians who go to the UK for work, young Australians who are very liberal minded, obviously they're travelling overseas, but literally they hang out with other Australians. Oh, it's like in Earth, the UK. Earth's they don't court. have any issues with New language Zealanders or anything. And Australians all over the world. Of course. Well, yeah. they, they, they love it, that's fine. Yeah. And, and so there's nothing wrong with it. Even in Australia, of course, you know, there's a certain element of that with different cultures as well. Mm. Certainly. Mm. Yes. But how can we get that feeling of being at home with the yeah. people that we're not brought up with? Yes. And, well, and, well, and yeah. learning to, to move our boundaries somehow. Absolutely. And I think mm. that's the adventure you were talking about earlier. Yes. yes. We have to put ourselves out there a little bit. We yeah. do. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And often that's about not, I mean, I often find when I go into different cultural situations, it's about uh, not being afraid to be totally embarrassed, you know, that you're going to muck up the protocols, that you're not going to know the language, that you might eat with the right spoon, wrong spoon, or whatever it is. But just, you know, forgive yourself and be uh, heartfelt and open and um, let go of some of the ego that sometimes prevents us from really crossing those boundaries. Now, I think what we might do is open this up to a, a questions and conversation with the audience. If anybody would like to add any comments, here's someone right down here. <coughs> here we go. Okay. Can Sorry. you stand up? Yeah, here, here, there's a microphone behind you. Great. 
Hello. Oh, hello. Um, so I just had two comments um, because there was a lot of talk about young people, and I am one, so I will speak. <laughs> uh -huh, um, my name is Zal, and I'm the youth ambassador for Western Australia, actually. So I feel like um, I would just like to add two points. One about forgetting baggage um, and harping on about our, our past. So I guess I'm second generation Australian. Um, I was born in Sydney and now I live on Noongar country here. Um, I have a history and a past. My parents, my grandparents, their positives and negatives, their trauma and their achievements. Um, my languages, multiple, my family, my culture. And I'll never forget that. Um, and I want to learn about who I am. And that's why I guess we harp on about our past because I need to learn that. I need to know who I am and where I came from. And that's not really available here. So I, I just want to understand that. Um, and I'm not a kid with raggedy clothes and neither were my parents, um, but I need to know who I am and to be listened to and to be understood. And I guess the other, the other comment that I wanted to make was about what to do for young people. So I guess what I just said then may help you all understand about some of the internal conflicts that young people do face about trying to learn purpose, identity, understand who we are, especially those from migrant backgrounds. So I guess what young people need is networks and a place to come, meet, gather with people that are role models and have experienced these things like today with all of you here. Um, and to be in a room where we feel that we're understood. And I guess that's part of the whole netball thing as to why they're maybe not playing netball. You know, I played basketball when I was young and I got to state level um, here. And I would share some of my stories and some of the past that I'd experienced, but that not, may not always be listened to and properly understood or cared about in a genuine way. So I guess that's what we need. We need places to come together, speak and be heard and listened to with a genuine way. So yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, hope someone else can That was beautiful. That was beautiful, thank you. Oh, there's someone right here, yeah. right behind. Hello. Um, I'm a daughter of Greek migrants who came out in the 50s, and I don't... I had a hard time, even though I may not look it now, but I found being... Growing up in the 80s, humour was really important, and yeah. I think you guys are so serious with this. Look at Wogs Out of Work. Look at how they took it, and they made fun of themselves, and it was a wonderful way for Greeks and Italians of that time to fit in. And I, I just find that humour is something that we don't tap into as much as we could. And I just thought, that's, any thoughts on that one? I think that's a really good question. I think it's actually a really good comment as well. And, you know, I used to work at the Enmore Theatre and walks out of work, used to pay all the time. Mind you, I would just show people their seats. But it was um, <laughs> the 90s. But anyway, but it, it's... Um, for me, the only thing is, even things like walks out of work, for example, happened when the Italian, the Lebanese, the Greek community actually took a different position of power in the community. It's much easier to make fun of yourself when you don't have, when you have, I mean, it's hard because you've got something to lose in a sense, absolutely, but you have something to stand on. I think it's much more difficult, it would be much more difficult for Greeks and Italians who were here in the 50s, and you've got to think, it was only 66 when Holt changed immigration policy around you know, European migration, so you've got to think, at that period of time, it was so difficult for people of Greek background. If they wanted to make a light of themselves, it would be, in fact, bringing themselves lower to where they were. Their qualifications weren't taken into place. They came out of a post-war situation where they had a terrible run and their countries were fairly devastated. They came here, worked incredibly hard on the Snowy Mountain Scheme and so many things. But they were in an unempowered position. And, of course, many years later, they took it as humour and it was a way to break other barriers. And I think that's really important. But it would be somewhat irresponsible to ask young people, say, who've come in the last five years from South Sudan, to make light of their situation in order to make other people feel comfortable. That's my yeah. only comment. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, to add to that, because uh, my mother was a linguist and she studied uh, humour as her postgrad stuff, <laughs> and how culturally specific humour is. And so, of course, if you heard me and my sister on the couch making jokes, they are 
you know, we, we wouldn't repeat them in front of anybody else, but they're from our very, you know, a, a shared cultural background that we feel quite safe in being quite off about various things. But um, it's how you take that into the public space and um, are respectful with it. And it, it's so hard when culture is, is such a big part of humour, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But you're right, everyone needs to laugh a little bit more <laughs> in the world at the <laughs> moment. <laughs> yes, would you like to say something down here? There you go. Hi, um, hello everyone. Um, me being here today is very significant because I've just come from my citizenship ceremony. <laughs> 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 Congratulations. <laughs> And um, I can tell you that um, it is extremely, extremely difficult. Um, and that's why humour... I've developed a sense of humour from having anxiety and depression after moving here, mm. you know. But um, it has been a very difficult um, a journey for me. Um, and... The thing is, everyone does want to fit in. Essentially, as a human being, we all want to fit in and we all want to belong. But we have here, like you said, systems and structures that are non-inclusive. That is a catastrophe because getting your qualifications recognized, for instance, getting, um, I, um, I have a master's degree in organizational psychology. Mm. I've got 10 years background in training development, and yet, I'm trying to get a job in retail. Mm. I worked at Coles at the deli. I still am struggling to get a job. It's not that I can't speak English. You know, my qualifications are not recognised. I don't have the money to get it recognised. You know, uh, my brother's a surgeon. He's brought all his family here, contracted by the government, and now they're putting him through exams where he's about and failing him because. Mm. A small group of top specialists, who, he's a consultant eye surgeon, top specialists who sit on the board do not want to have him, mm. do not want to include because they have to have to share, you know, um, the, a piece of their pie. And, and it's all part of the system where, um, where it, it, it is, um, supposedly maintaining standards, yeah. but in actual fact, there's a lot of structures that is actually non-inclusive. I should be contributing to society. I don't want to be Absolutely. on the dome. I want to be able to be productive and be at that level where I can contribute. It's like the old boys' network. Absolutely. Um, and, and I think it is very difficult for migrants. And if we... The, Coming from a multicultural country like Malaysia, I'm from Malaysia as well, um, the sad thing is, for me, was not celebrating um, each, <coughs> the, the, the diversity. There is, at a, to a certain level, but if we actually included everyone, the country will become extremely rich in terms of culture, economically, experiences. Um, there is no reason to, to not include people. And one of the things I think we should really challenge is the, um, the idea that we base, the, the rule that we ask people when they apply for jobs, mm. that you have to have Australian experience. That, I think, is very discriminatory for everyone. It is discrimination because I've got 10 years experience. I work for the World Health Organization. I come here and I can't get a job because yeah. that is the way to keep you out. You do not get a job because you don't have Australian experience and that is not right. No. That's a, you make a really fantastic point. And this is a real reality for so many people here. In fact, there's been a bunch of studies done on this as well. I know Deloitte did one recently in Queensland. And it shows that this is not just bad for the individual like yourself, but also in terms of what we're losing in our economy. Mm -hmm. This is hundreds of millions of dollars worth of loss in each state. But apart from that, it's also a problem with immigration policy. I mean, to go back to the initial question of all this, we have a problem where we've set KPIs where there's a disconnect between we have a skills list, we need so many doctors, we need 
so many surgeons we need, so many engineers we need, so many whatever. But there's a disconnect between, but that's judged on how many of those numbers come in. So yes, we have given permanent residents or visas to so many hundreds Five of doctors. surgeons, whatever it is, right? The only thing is, there's no connection between that and what the outcome is. Do those people come here and work as doctors? Yeah. Do they come here and work as engineers? So it's a terrible problem with the way in which the system is developed. So we are always, as, as Australians, we are always underskilled as well. Because we keep saying, yes, we need these 15% more engineers in northern and western Australia, but we always need them. Because even though we're bringing in those 15%, there's no connection and no KPI for the government between that and having them in those jobs. And they all go to Melbourne anyway. And they go to Melbourne anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yes. And with the Australian experience part that you mentioned, that's right. That's a, that's a bit of a... I'm not sure where that came from. Because if you go to the United States to work, no one asks you, you know, Oh, have you got an experience working as an organizing psychologist in New York? No. They ask whether you have those skills and experience. And that's something that requires change. And it's something that we have changed in some jobs in regards to gender. You know, there used to be jobs where they used to say, oh, there's no female train drivers up in, you know, working in the mine oh, sites. Right. Why is there none? But like the JDFs will say, like, you know, you have experience as a train driver, blah, blah, blah. But if there's if there's no one who's a female train driver, no one's going to have that experience to fill that job. Mm -hmm. What you want is someone who has the skills to drive a train. And there's all these sort of practical things that could be put into place around that as well. So yeah, you're yes. right. Mad bureaucracy. <laughs> Does anybody else have a question? This person back here. There you go. Right, just to your left. Yep. <clears throat> um, you've all talked about the traditional migrants. Um, the political refugees, the economic um, seeking aspirations and prey to the fam uh, family. But what about all the say, new classes? Um, I'm talking about sort of digital nomads, people who come in on a tourist visa, who's like, um, I mean, I've, I've been in Bali, I've seen them, they're burnt out, they're highly skilled, and they are lost. I mean, they come to Australia, they, you know, as I said, highly skilled, talented, all they want to do is like, you know, go on a camper, tour around. How do we engage these new classes of migrants and make them productive for Australia? Well, you've well, got us all stumped here. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, and you know what I was thinking when you were talking about is, of course, everything's going to change with climate change. Um, it may be that Australians are going to need to go and live somewhere else in the next 100 years. Um, and we'll all be trying to get to 42 degrees below um, to get out of this heat zone. Um, who knows? I mean, a lot of that's about the migration of capital and business, isn't it? And that people can be based, as my friend does, she teaches English on the web, um, and she travels. And so she'll just teach from wherever she happens to be house sitting or traveling and um, her income I guess is based in her home of residence. I don't quite know how it works but you're right that work is going to be um, really challenged in the future. The way we work might be more mobile and may not make sense within a kind of sovereign border paradigm. Mm. I think that might be our last question for no, the day. Well. We've got one quick one. We've got lady time for front. one more. Yes, lady in the front here. Looking at the time. Oh, sorry, three minutes. Yeah. Shoot! <coughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm feeling a bit like a migrant myself today because although, although I'm fifth generation Australian, I grew up in Victoria, but I spent most of my life in Darwin. I've only come to Perth in the last couple of years. Um, Darwin is known as a very successful multicultural society, and I find it very interesting today that some of the questions that have been raised, I've never heard in Darwin. Um, it's, it's a place where people like me go, having grown up without faces that didn't look like mine. I grew up in a country town in Victoria, and everybody more or less looked like me. Uh, I had some young friends, Monica, Ilona and Krista, who were from those East European countries, and that was very interesting to me, but they really didn't look very different. Um, and 
Uh, to go to Darwin, where you find you are part of a much bigger society, and of course you've got the the indigenous society there as well, very, well integrated to the community, and you you have very early Chinese immigrants to Darwin. Uh, you have Afghanis who came there with the camels in uh, the 19th century. So. I think one of the reasons Darwin is so successful as a multicultural community hmm. is that there have been different people there all the time. Oh. It was not um, dominantly white from the beginning, hmm. and I think that has made a very big difference. Many people go there to look and try to establish why it is so successful and what they can perhaps implement in their own communities, hmm. uh, but I'm not sure it translates very well to other places because of the history of that particular city, but it's well worth a look. It's a beautiful way to close, and it um, reminds me of something I heard on the, on the radio a couple of weeks ago and relates to what you've said probably as a closing, which is the importance of somehow, whatever the mechanism is going to be, of acknowledging the sovereignty of Indigenous people. And this woman on the radio, when she was asked why that was important, she said, it's to allow them the power of welcoming, welcoming us all to live in this country. Mm. That, that's what, you know, that will be the end result. And I thought that was a very beautiful way mm. to put it. So thank you all for being here today. Um, and especially thank you to our Auslan interpreters as well. Thank you. Very hard working. <laughs> Um, there's a break now, and then at 3.30, there is going to be um, a panel about the truth of making a living as a writer. Uh, not an easy one. And also at 3.30, <laughs> Dr. Carl will be signing his book, if anyone needs to have their book signed. So thank you to my panellists, especially our Mary. spontaneous yeah. guest, Mary, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.